Good morning. Welcome to Cedardale. We're uh, anxious to have a wonderful service today. And today is Communion Sunday, so if you don't have one ready, be sure to get your juice and cracker ready, and you can join the pastor in Communion a little later. Um, I'm going to read you today's scripture reading, which is Acts chapter 10, verses 38 to 41. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are all witnesses of the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible not to all the people, but to the witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. That's today's scripture reading. Pastor? Welcome. As Kay mentioned, today is Communion Sunday, and it's always a good time to remember the Lord. In Luke chapter 22, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, it says this, And when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the good shepherd and you are the one whose blood was shed for us. We thank you, Father, for this moment of opportunity that we can celebrate Jesus and we can be reminded of his great work. We can be reminded of the atoning sacrifice on Calvary's cross for us. And we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Friends, yes, Jesus is the bread of life, but his body was broken for us that we might have life and have it more abundantly, so abundantly. Take and eat. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the only begotten one who was given to us as a ransom for many. Father, we thank you that he was the suffering servant mentioned in Isaiah 53. And because of his wounds, we are healed, healed in the moment of salvation, healed for the goodness of God. And we thank you, Father, for your goodness and mercy to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Also on the same night, he took the cup and said, this is, this is my blood which is shed for you. The blood of Emmanuel was shed for us because there's power in the blood. As we've sang last Sunday and in the old hymn books, it's still there, friends, that wonderful hymn, There is Power in the Blood. And the power of Jesus' blood, it's an amazing thing because there's life in the blood, as the Old Testament would tell us. But with Jesus, his blood was shed for us, and it ran down Calvary's cross, that you and I would be able to join in with him in this wonderful moment, not only of salvation, but in his kingdom glory, and celebrate the wonders of what he is going to do down the road. We thank you for him. Take and drink. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to think about the wonderful atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ made on Calvary's cross that we might have life, that we might be entered into the wonderful glory of the Lord, that we could find not only an adoption that you mentioned in Romans 8, but that we can be free 
and that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever, as the psalmist David would say. Thank you, Father, for your incredible gift. And we thank you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today's message is called, Is Your Witness Expanding? There's a number of texts that I'm going to read before I read our main text today. And our main text is Acts chapter 1, 6 to 8. But here are some others that will chime in with that wonderful bounty of scripture. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In John 15, 27. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. In Zechariah 4, 6, it will say this. And so he answered and said to me, this is the word of Zerubbabel, of the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Yes, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 8 to 8, it says this. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Bruce Larson had an unusual way of convincing people to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ. When he was working in New York City, he would walk a man or woman downtown to the front of the RCA building on Fifth Avenue. In front of the building, there was a gigantic statue of a massively proportioned, magnificently muscled atlas, the world resting on his shoulders. As powerfully built as he is, he is straining under the weight, barely able to stand. Larson would say, now that's one way to live, trying to carry the world on your shoulders, but now come across the street with me. Across the street is St. Patrick's Cathedral. There behind the altar is a little shrine of the boy Jesus. He appears to be no more than eight or nine years of age. As little and frail as he appears, he is holding the world in one hand. Then Larson would say, we have a choice. We can carry the world on our shoulders, or we can say, I give up, Lord. Here's my life. I give you my world, my whole world to you. The book of Acts is a unique, so unique because of its insight into the accomplishments of the early church and passionate apostles. Acts tells us how Christianity began to spread throughout the known world. And Luke is the author of Acts and the Gospel of Luke. We know he was a physician. We know he was a Gentile. And we certainly know he was a devoted companion of Paul. Written to Theophilus, this man may have been a Christian wanting instruction. He may have been a Roman official being briefed by Luke about the history of this new Christian movement. Or the name could be symbolic because he, his name, Theophilus, means God lover. We know Theophilus was a Gentile. And in the introduction, Luke addresses Theophilus with the title, Most Excellent, which was a way to address people who held high office in that day. We must remember that the book of Acts does not give us a complete history of the early church during this time. For instance, the churches of Galilee and Samaria are barely mentioned in Acts 9.31, and the establishing of a strong church in Egypt during this time isn't mentioned at all. The book of Acts spans a period of 30 years and takes us to around 60 to 61 AD with Paul in Rome waiting to appear before Caesar Nero, this same Nero who began his horrendous persecutions of Christians in 64 AD. The disciples of our Lord ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And this was a question asked many times before, but it had a special importance now. They knew that Jesus instituted the new covenant in Luke 22, actually the text that we just read. They also knew that the restoration of the kingdom to Israel was part of that new covenant. 
Their curiosity burned in their wonder of when the new covenant would be fulfilled. The response of our Lord indicates that he did not rebuke them for their question. He tells them the answer wasn't for them to know at this time. The verb restore shows that the disciples were expecting a political and national kingdom and were expecting a restored Israel to be established. The progress of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then to the end of the world or the earth becomes the outline of the book of Acts. In Acts 1 to 7 describes the gospel in Jerusalem. Acts 8 to chapter 12 speaks of the gospel in Judea and Samaria. And Acts 13 to 28 tells of the gospel going to the end of the earth. You see, Jerusalem was where J Jesus was executed at the word of an angry mob. Judea rejected his ministry. Samaria was regarded as a wasteland. And the uttermost part of the world or earth, the Gentiles were seen by many in their day as barbarians and unfit for the truth of God. Yet, God desires a witness sent to all these places, and the Holy Spirit would empower them to do his mighty work. But you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. The disciples, brethren, were thinking not of a kingdom of God embracing all mankind, but a sovereignty restored to the nation of Israel. Their minds were full of a temporal kingdom to be set up by Christ in which the Jewish people would have dominion over all the nations and shake off the shackles of Rome and rise to universal dominion. The incredible expansion of the gospel message from Jerusalem to Rome is, is utterly amazing. Humanly speaking, Christianity had nothing going for it. It had no money, no proven leaders, no technological tools, for spreading the glorious gospel. And it faced enormous obstacles. It was utterly new. It taught truths that were incredible to the unregenerate world. And it was the subject to the most intense hatreds and persecutions, says Boyce. First, a witness expands. Did you know that Christopher Columbus died in 1506 in Spain, where he passed away? If you go there today, you will see a monument commemorating the great discoverer. Perhaps the most interesting feature of the memorial is a statue of a lion destroying one of the Latin words on the memorial. The words have been part of Spain's motto for centuries. The words are ni plus ultra, which means no more beyond. Before Columbus made his voyages, the Spaniards thought that they had reached the outer limits of the earth. Thus their motto was, ni plus ultra, which means no more beyond. The word being torn away by the lion is the word ni or no. And so today it reads plus ultra. Columbus had proven that there was indeed more beyond. The world could never be understood the same way ever again. When it comes to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, you can never write ni plus ultra, no more beyond because the book of Acts continues the ongoing story of Jesus Christ. When Jesus, there is always plus ultra. The message of the book of Acts is very clear. There is more. And so the story of Jesus and his church continues. Jesus is sending his disciples from Jerusalem in ever-expanding circles until all the nations are evangelized, meaning that the good news is being heralded throughout the world. Jesus is not talking of an occasional word of witness within our comfort of friends. He is talking about ever-expanding efforts to penetrate more and more of Satan's strongholds of unbelief. The power mentioned can come not from none other than the Lord himself, for it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The Holy Spirit is essential for an expanding witness for Christianity. So here is a unique question for all of us today. Have you ever wondered why, when God saved you, he left you and I here on the earth? If God had wanted to, he could have taken you and I directly to heaven the moment that we trusted in Christ. William Arnott, a Scottish, a Scottish pastor many, many years ago, said this, To every Christian, these two things may be said. You have need of Christ, and Christ has need of you. 
And then he adds this thought. The simple fact that a Christian is on earth and is not in heaven is proof that there is something for him or her to do. And if she is or he is not doing it, the neglect shows either that he or she is not yet a Christian or that he or she is a Christian who grieves Christ. So what is it that Christ has left you and I here to do? What is it that we can do on earth that we can never do in heaven? Well, we can sing on earth and we can sing in heaven. Revelation is full of that. We can pray on earth and we can pray in heaven. Revelation 6.10. We can fellowship with other believers here on earth and we will certainly fellowship with others of like mind in heaven. But there is one main thing that you and I can do on earth that we can never do in heaven. And you know what it is? Tell a lost sinner about Christ Jesus. So if you're going to share the good news of the glorious gospel, you've got to do it while you're here on earth. Friends, he left us here on earth so that we might be witnesses, as he says in Acts 1.8. In heaven, there is no evangelism because seeing is believing. In heaven, everyone is redeemed by the blood, wonderful blood of the Lamb. And Revelation 5 on will tell us that. Believe it or not, he uses people like us to share, proclaim, preach, herald, and tell his grand and glorious truth. Yes, we, every one of us, are his witnesses, his living epistles. We are his wonderful workmanship, his encouraging testament to a dying world, his living scrolls he invites everyone to read. And Acts 1.8 emphasizes two dynamic things we need to know. First, the Holy Spirit empowers disciples. And he'll even say that in Isaiah 61, when the Lord's anointed is empowered by the Spirit of God with dynamis, dunamis, or power, which means ability, abundance, and might. Second, spirit-filled witnesses witness about Jesus around the world. Again, Acts 1.8. It's not sports, not the weather, not the headlines, or the morning news. It's the good news about Jesus Christ and the Lord and his blessed benefits about our glorious Savior King. We need his power and divine help more than ever today. Christians and non-Christians have something in common. We're both uptight about evangelism, says Rebecca Pippert. Many Christians choose to be aware of the person, but then feel defensive and guilty for not evangelizing. Our problem in evangelism is not that we don't have enough information. It is that we don't know how to be ourselves. We forget we are called to be witnesses of what we've seen and know, not to what we don't know. The key on our part is authenticity and obedience. Our uneasiness with non-Christians reflects our uneasiness with the gospel. And many of us avoid evangelism for fear of, that we will offend someone else, says Rebecca. A pastor recounts his story, and I will quote, I remember being a, with a Christian student on a beach during an evangelism training week, he says. Bob and I met several religious skeptics and began talking about all sorts of things. Eventually, the conversation got around to Christianity, and it was a lively and invigorating discussion. We even exchanged addresses before leaving. I was feeling very good about the conversation, but Bob seemed very quiet. When I asked him what was wrong, he said, I thought it was an absolute failure, he said. There are four main points to the gospel, and you brought in only two of them, and they weren't even in the right order. I said, what were the names of the three people we met this afternoon? Oh, I don't know, he said. What in the world difference does that make? There were two females and one male? Or was it the other way around? I stared at him in disbelief and sadness. Here was a young man who genuinely loved the Lord. He was exceedingly religious and sincere. I doubt that he ever missed a day of his daily devotions, and yet he had missed the entire point. He was sure his agenda, his four points, were the supreme value, yet his program was so rigid that the real life human beings could not penetrate it. We must be aware of this kind of Phariseeism, for it is so frequently the disease of the devoted. This student was so busy rehearsing his four points of salvation that he forgot that he was speaking to the very people Christ had come to save. End quote. Christ had come to save them. 
Brethren, we must never forget to be that to be a follower of Jesus is to be dominated by love. We need to circle the word began in chapter 1, verse 1, because this is very important. Every other religion tells us the founder of their religion completed his or her ministry in their lifetime. Luke tells us Jesus simply began his ministry, but there was more, much more to come after he left this earth. God is always at work, and we need to continually hear that. God is still working. Luke writes to Christians in order to reassure us. God is still working. This is the work of God. Luke tells us Christianity is not about being perfect. It's about what he's done. God is at work beside and be before us. He works behind, beneath, below, and beyond you and I. God has a plan as well. And he is at work advancing his plan in your personal life, mine, and then the life of his church. Right now, Jesus is speaking and acting. Right now. He is alive and he is building his church. So all sorts, all sorts of things Acts mentions are happening there. And they're still happening today. Secondly, a witness tells what he or she knows. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the presence of love, someone has said. Shannon Evans says, If my testimony of the gospel revolves around a plotline of, I used to struggle with this, but God gave me the victory, and now I'm free, I'm healed, I'm saved, or fill in the blank with whatever you want. I have immediately distanced myself from the listener of my testimony by implying that I have arrived in a place where they are not, she says. And she goes on. No doubt we find freedom and healing and salvation in Jesus and want that for others too. But the reality come, continues to be that we are also or must be ourselves in the process. The power of the gospel is not that we no longer suffer or struggle, but that we no longer do so. Alone, she says. Evangelism isn't something we do out there and then go back to normal living. Evangelism involves taking people seriously, getting across their islands of concern and needs and disappointments, and sharing Christ as Lord in the context of our situations. Christianity is about what Jesus began, is currently doing, and will bring to completion any notion that Christianity is merely the result of something we do is always completely wrong and it is always the activity of God, says Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Anyone is invited to receive his free gift of grace if they will be willing to reason with him, Isaiah 1, 18 and 19. Pentecost was the Holy Spirit's entrance into the world to declare that he was present to assist all who believe in Jesus Christ and to reveal his power, and it's available to all Christ followers. When the Holy Spirit falls upon you and I in power, we are given power like this, a deep conviction to witness. This is our great need today. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Did you, did you see that at the end of that verse? Deep conviction. When God clothes his witnesses with power from on high, the effect is a deep certainty, a holy confidence, and a noble conviction about Christ and the reality of his life and his work. Friends, Acts 4.31 says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, shaken physically, and they were all filled with the Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly or with boldness. They had a spirit of power, 2 Timothy 1, 78 would say, they had a holy convincing wisdom with irresistible words. So what about you and me today? Are we satisfied with our spiritual level of power and our witness for Christ? Pray, seek the Lord, and ask for opportunities that only he can give. The greatest thing anyone or any church can do is prayerfully pray. Get on our knees and ask the Lord of all to help us win this lost world for Christ. Christ longs for this world, as it says in so many texts in the Gospels, and we should too. Dr. Chris Wells stated once that an amazing development occurred in Christian history. For hundreds and hundreds of years, it was debated whether or not we had any obligation 
to preach the gospel to the world. Can you believe that, friend? It's amazing what can happen when people deny scripture, pervert scripture, or ignore the Holy Scripture. When English people came to the Duke of Wellington and said, do you think it's important that we preach the gospel to the lost? He replied instantly, what are your marching orders? What did Jesus say? The mandate of the Lord is explicit, he said. There is nothing in the word of God plainer than our assignment. For the evangelization and discipling and the winning of the lost, yes, all peoples of the world for him. In fact, there is no excuse written in the book ever. It's nothing to do with how hard it is or the tremendous sacrifices to be made or the fierce opposition we face or the horrible persecution that might be around the corner. It's an incredible holy mandate that we go and evangelize the peoples of the world. We are to tell what we know. Why all the urgency of the great commission of our Lord? The answer from the blessed Bible makes the answer so incredibly clear. The world of humanity is lost without Christ. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 1 John 1, I mean 5, verse 12. We face an eternal doom unless we are saved by His grace. It's difficult to forget that it was Jesus who spoke most about the peril of the lost. No matter how you want to express it, theologically, philosophically, economically, or any way you want to say it, brother, man and women are lost without God. This is our awesome responsibility. Ever since Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Ever since Ezekiel wrote, the blood of the lost is on our hands, Ezekiel 33, one to nine. We are to be witnesses, it's not an option. I can know I can't escape it, and neither can everyone in this church or listening online today. That's right. If you lined up all the lost people, that line around the world, that line would stretch around the world, world 30 times and the line is growing 20 miles each day, someone said, and I do not know the author. And we are facing a world that doesn't know God and is getting more ignorant and intolerable each and every day. Jesus, Lord of the harvest, said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. How far are we to go? Yes, brethren, we are to go to the ends of the world. And this is his marvelous mandate for the church. In conclusion, beginning in Jerusalem, Acts 1.8, Jesus says, You shall be witnesses to me. Brethren, the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. If we are not interested in the lost here, we won't be interested in the lost out there. We need to win people in our Jerusalem of Georgina. Here is an incredible fact. That little band of disciples plus Matthias faced the entire Roman Empire with the great message of redemption, with no resources at all, none but the Holy Spirit. That little band of preachers began the modern missionary movement in power and persuasion that God was with them. This ought to be our commitment in our day. This is not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. It's a purposeful, prayerful, praying on our knees issue. Pray, pray, and pray some more. Why? Because prayer reminds us that God's in charge. Yes, it does. Not us. We're not in charge. We must surrender ourselves to him. And with him in charge, we are to cooperate with him in this marvelous endeavor. Saying, Lord, you can do anything you want. Well, we may not be versed in scripture or have a seminary super duper degree or background, and we may be timid and unsure of ourselves, but we have arms and hearts, and there, these were meant to be used for him. We must ask, do I treat people as royalty walking the earth, including my parents, my spouse, my roommate, the student on the floor that I can't stand? Does my life bear the mark of profound love? When our loves are characterized with the love of Christ, we can begin to interest people in the glorious gospel. How's your witness? Are you energized by Jesus' promise when he said, you shall be my witnesses in Acts 1.8? Are you telling what you know about Jesus? 
Dr. A.C. Dixon said, when we rely upon organization, we get what organizations can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely upon eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely upon the Holy Spirit, we get what God can do. Amen? Are you energized by Jesus' promise? Are you captured by Jesus' message? The message of the gospel certainly captured the early Christians' hearts and minds. Has it captured yours? The world needs to see his miraculous power. His power to transform and change lives. His power to heal our brokenness. His power to rout principalities and powers. Why does the world resort to alcohol and drugs and, and fortune tellers and Eastern religions and cults? Why do so many take antidepressants and even worse? Because there's a spiritual vacuum. The church is not displaying the power of Christ. And so the world doesn't know where to go to find the almighty God. One time there was a massive parade in New York with hundreds of balloons and motorized floats moving through the streets. In the middle of the parade, one of the floats stalled and blocked the progress of all the others. Do you want to guess which one ran out of gas? Yes, the one belonging to the Standard Oil Company, also known as Exxon. What an embarrassment and a contradiction. How could the largest oil company in the world run out of gas? Brethren, how can the Church of Jesus Christ, which had been endued with power from on high, find itself without sufficient power for the job called to do of reaching Canada and beyond? The Holy Spirit is the only power that can liberate lost people. You know what? The church will never be the church without his power because of this. Talent is never enough. Let me say that again. Talent is never enough because the Holy Spirit turns weaklings into witnesses. Dr. Kyle Betis once said, if God were to take away the Holy Spirit out of our midst today, about 95% of what we are doing in our churches would go on and on and no one would know the difference. Did you know that Moody was to have a campaign in England? An elderly pastor protested. Why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's uneducated, inexperienced, and he went on and on. Who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? A younger and wiser pastor rose and responded. No, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. Friend, I'm going to ask you today, does, they, does the Spirit of God have a monopoly on you today? Do you know that the return of Christ isn't a rescue mission? It's a coronation ceremony of the greatest king who's ever lived. This isn't about an evacuation of earth, but an invasion of heaven. The Bible begins with the story of a new creation and ends with the story of a new creation restored. Amen? The sin-ruined creation of Genesis is restored in the sacrifice renewed creation of Revelation. His victory will be complete and our redemption will be final. So, is your witness expanding for him? I hope it is. Keep going, brethren. Keep going. Be the living epistle that you are meant to be at this time for him and his glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We ask, Lord, that you would revive us and renew us and revive your work in the midst of the day, and in the midst of this day, make it known, Lord. We ask that you give us a wonderful, sterling adventure in our heart. We pray that you would give us the passion of the apostles, and we pray that our feet would go where you direct us. Lord God, we pray that we'd be a light to all the peoples of the world, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.